It's been called the American Bible, and it comes alive this weekend with the Moby Dick Art Fest. The four days of events kick off this evening and include a symposium, panel discussion, a marathon reading of the novel, and an exhibit of artworks inspired by the novel created by Northern Kentucky University students over the past two decades. Bob, tell me why Moby Dick is referred to as the American Bible. Well, uh, it keeps speaking like the Bible does uh, with new meanings to every generation. I find that in teaching. Uh, we see it in the broader culture. And I've read it many, many times and taught it a lot of times. And it's always a different experience. So uh, before introducing our first speaker, I'd like to give my short answer to the topic Mark has posed for tonight. Moby Dick, how a 19th century novel speaks to the 21st century. My short answer is, call me Ishmael. Um, this famous opening line has taken on a new meaning in the 21st century, after the event that we know as 9-11 in this country. How can I choose well? How can I live in harmony with all my fellow beings? What is the meaning of life? How may I live a a meditation on all things sacred, and above all, it is about the titanic struggle that every one of us faces as a human being in terms of trying to say to a cold and uncaring and violent universe that I am here and it's that I matter. It's the sense that the book somehow intimately, uncannily, politically addresses readers about their times that I'm interested in. A little bit in. about uh, the work that was in our catalog, um, because a lot of it, as Dr. Rawls mentioned, was created in the 21st century. So I want to talk about how his students reacted to the book. So many images of Moby Dick, Ahab, Ishmael, Queequeg, uh, uh, you know, wailing implements. Uh, um, but Mac did indeed illustrate this. Three times. <laughs> I remember them all. And I should confess here in public now that Matt sold on the internet for a remarkably small price the original images, and I own one of the stories. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's surprising uh, to many first time readers of Moby Dick is that it's a very funny novel. And um, comedy occurs in yeah. lots of Good. different ways. Okay. Yes. Lots of Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely, having little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on shore, I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. It is the way I have of driving off that A Again, I always go to sea as a sailor because they make a point of paying me for my trouble. Whereas they never pay passengers a single penny that I heard of. On the contrary, passengers themselves must pay. And there is all the difference in the world between paying and being paid. Uh, there's a marathon right now here in Kentucky. A total of 12 hours today and 12 hours tomorrow. All of Moby Dick will be read. Readers for 10 minute intervals. Um, uh, read in a series and read the entire book. You don't know what you're going to read. And you get to see and hear Melville's words um, from a range of perspectives. Uh, this reading here in the Covington Public Library um, has drawn so far a, a diverse variety, young and old. And such events can only be sustained because of the deep interest in the book, the fascination with the words um, with every page. The spouter in. Peter Coffin. Coffin? Spouter? Rather ominous in that particular connection, thought I. But it is a common okay, name. So, in the this is a show of, of 20 years Peter of Moby Dick inspired artwork by students in Dr. Wallace's Moby Dick in the Arts classes uh, through the English department. So, some of the students are art majors but a lot of them are English majors and then there's over a hundred artworks and it's on they're on all three floors of the library uh, so he you know he asked me at the end of that 2013 spring semester if I would collaborate with him you know I thought he was as my mentor was going to take a leading role and I was going to follow but because art is not his main field. He looked at me as an expert in a lot of ways. He really valued my opinion and my experience. Um, 
so I really felt like I got to work professionally without the fear of like losing my job. Or... So it was a, it was a really cool experience that helped me become more confident in my abilities as an art historian, as a curator. Traditionally, what a faculty do is they teach Moby Dick, and they have students write interpretive analytical papers, um, which is um, an important form of student response. Um, but to my knowledge, no one um, in the U.S. or anywhere um, has for so long with such success in such a sustained way um, encouraged students to respond to this book um, creatively. And one can see the results at the exhibit uh, here at the Covington Public Library, um, uh, an extraordinary range of media and um, a deep student uh, creative responses that are also critical interpretations of um, Moby Dick. Of course, while I was in Bob's class, I had a lot of um, motivation and also creating my work for my senior show, I had the motivation to create that body of work, both as a class project for Bob and also for my printmaking thesis. But after that, um, of course, I kept in touch with Bob and he would um, keep me in touch also with other people and uh, other Moby Dick related events. So uh, not too long after I graduated, um, he spoke to me about doing a map uh, for the Longman edition and he, he put me in touch with the editors of, of the Longman edition. No of town bread and dandy will compare with the country bread one. I mean a downright bumpkin dandy. A fellow that, in the dog days, will mow his two acres in buckskin gloves for fear of tanning his hands. Dr. Wallace now, is a quintessential professor, but he's so kind. He is so kind. He does not diminish a student. You know, even if you didn't do well, you go away feeling as if you did. And that, I think, is, ignites a spark to do better. Interesting that the collection is displayed on three different floors and in many nooks and crannies of the, of the library. So uh, looking at the exhibition is really like reading the novel. It is uh, an exploration. It is a discovery. You turn a corner or you turn a page and, oh, there's something else to learn, something else to see. And I think that the genius of this exhibition is that it does encourage uh, people to look for meaning. And in addition to that, uh, the exhibition is thrilling to me because of the diversity of its media. There are oil paintings, there are ceramics, there is sculpture, there is photography, and uh, there are quilts. Uh, a wide, wide variety of uh, aesthetic representation is explored here. Well, that's the big question. Why has Moby Dick inspired so much and such diverse art and continues to do so? Why this novel and why not other novels? On the basis of my study in uh, the 20th century, I came to believe that uh, Moby Dick is the most frequently illustrated American novel amongst all novels. Um. Breaking news for you. Unfortunately, we just got word that the Pequod has gone down. Breaking news, Blair. Oh Rebecca's already taken oh out one of the shoes. I don't know what's happening with the other one. The crew is in disarray. A museum in Terre Haute has this collection of all his artwork. So I wrote a, for a research grant, um, I got to travel to Terre Haute with Dr. Wallace and my partner Jay, and we made a short little documentary about, about the whole thing, about the trip, but also about Gilbert's collection, his artwork. So throughout the 
novel, this this white whale is is talked about as a monster. He's he's vicious. He's killed people. He's ruined ships. As I'm reading it, uh, and as I'm thinking about environmentalism, I'm always siding with the whale. I'm always feeling for him. I I think that he would be an amazing thing to see, a beautiful thing to see. Uh, he's albino. How unique is that? Here, going in her bee. She sails today. The captain came aboard last night. What captain? Ahab? Who but him indeed? I was going to ask him some further questions. But I wanted my own close-fitting coffin lid, like Queequeg's. And I wanted to transcribe my theory of the truths and meaning of life onto it. And so I thought about that plaster cast process. And so I did it twice. This was the first one. Um, this is the second. Um, they're, they were made about a year apart. And you can see the amount of difference we had come so far from just the kind of crude beginnings of understanding the novel and our reactions to it to something more polished and better of all. In the story, you go from it being about Queequeg, his life, his death, and then what his coffin becomes, how it becomes a life-saving vessel for someone else. That's how I felt, being pregnant with my daughter and bringing her into the world. And so the inside of it is much more important to me than the outside. Enough about his losing his leg last voyage, according to the prophecy. Didn't you hear a word about them matters and something more, eh? Nah, I don't think you did. How could you? Um, Who knows it? Not it had more to do with putting, your, putting yourself into the perspective of Ahab. Uh, so a part of my, my piece was to actually make a peg leg, which is right here, um, and then the goal was to actually wear the peg leg for 24 hours. I had a pedometer with me, counting the number of steps I took that day, and that's actually the size. The, the entire drawing is the same square foot contact that I had with Earth sort of thing. I mean, it's a, I guess the idea. little pair doing now, crying its eyes out, giving a party to the arrived harpooners. I dare say gay is a frigate's pennant, so I am <laughs> Sarah. Oh, well, we drink tonight with hearts as light to love and gay and fleeing as bubbles that swim and breakers brim. They break upon the lips while meeting. Thank you. All right. <laughs> thirstily drinking at every new gash, as the eager Israelites did at the new bursting fountains that poured from the smitten rock. At last his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned tracks. upon his back. Resulting, however, to sleep ashore to the last. Two were but it seems they always give very long notice in these cases, and the ship did not sail for several days. But no wonder. There was senior semester, I believe, spring of 2012. Um, my work is Reliance. It's this pinwheel I'm getting reacquainted with here. For me personally, I'm not, I'm not an artist. I'm not a visual artist at all. I grew up loving writing and words and the power behind all of them. So um, at that time, we were comparing Douglas to Melville, and the final project was Be Visual. So to put the words of, of Douglas in first person against the text from Moby Dick, you know, the great white whale, and then the blackness of the skin constantly um, described in Douglas. In three minutes, Just a whole mile of shoreless ocean was between Pip and Stubb. Out from the center of the sea, poor Pip turned his crisp, curling black head to the sun, another lonely castaway, though the loft is the greatest. Yeah, so I did a cookbook style art piece um, called The Whale is a Dish, a cookbook for the women of New Bedford because I wanted to kind of bring a little bit of a feminine side to the book that was so very masculine. So I, it's recipes, it's poems, it's kind of drawings and doodles, so it's very like organic and I did a part in the back that's kind of devoted to Ahab's wife who's just vaguely mentioned in the Dr. book. Dr. Wall is saying so. like, here's an option for you. You know, but a lot of people didn't feel like they had anything to contribute artistically until they got into that class. So I think what's really special about this is seeing that, seeing people who, you know, maybe thought kind of like you know, how I did. Like, I don't necessarily have like an artistic thing to contribute here, but you know, when you push people and kind of give them the space to take that risk, I think um, really exciting things can happen. And I think that's what this show really. And even so, about. is the nature of the substance. It is an ineffably oozy, stringy affair 
most frequently found in the tubs of sperm after a prolonged squeezing and subsequent decanting. I hold it to be the wondrously thin ruptured membrane. I regard this as clear. I've seen doubloons before now in my voyagings. Your doubloons of old Spain, your doubloons of Peru, your doubloons of Chile, your doubloons of Bolivia, your doubloons of Paviana, with plenty of gold murrers and pistols and joes and half joes and quarter joes. Have white whale? So cried what Ahab, once more hailing a ship showing English colors, bearing down under the stern. Trumpet to mouth, the old man was standing in his hoisted quarter boat, his ivory leg plainly revealed to the stranger captain, who was carelessly reclining in his own boat's bow. He was a darkly tanned, burly, good-natured, fine-looking man of 60 or thereabouts, dressed in a spacious roundabout that hung about him in festoons of blue pilot cloth, and one empty arm of this jacket streamed behind him like the broidered arm of a hussar's surcoat. Hast seen the white whale? See you this? And withdrawing it from the folds that had hidden it, he held up the ah, how they still strove through that infinite blueness to seek out the one thing that might destroy them. Why sing ye not out for him, if ye see him, cried Ahab, when after lapse of some minutes, since the first cry, no one, no more had been heard. Sway me up, men, ye have been deceived. What more not wouldst thou have? Shall so we keep chasing this murderous fish till he swamps the last man? Shall we be dragged by him to the bottom of the sea? Shall we be towed by him to the infernal world? Oh, oh, impiety and blasphemy to hunt him more. Starbuck, of late I felt strangely moved to thee. Ever since that hour we both Good saw. Day to desist. See, Moby Dick seeks thee not. It is thou. Thou that madly seekest him. Setting sail the rising wind, the lonely boat was swiftly impelled to leeward. There was the dangerous cruising Rachel, that in her retracing search after her missing children, only found another orphan. Phoenix. hard, masculine business. And then we have this beautiful observations of the way that the world is and relationships. And I really wanted course, to emphasize course, that my in my own, own work. Because the person I was when I started doing this work uh, in Bob Wallace's class was not the person I was at this point in my life. And Moby Dick had played a large part in transforming me, transforming my work into something oh, new. I will be doing a painting. I might be doing more than one painting, but there will be paintings. And then we show up <laughs> to the final. There were not paintings. <laughs> there was a tea set. This was something that you don't often hear in a classroom setting, which is that if you think deeply and engage um, the literature in an original way, um, the thing that you contribute to the broader conversation is going to have value. Standard paper with uh, using quotes and analysis and trying to build up this like tripartite Ishmael. Uh, but when they draw it, it's much, much easier and they can get to very sophisticated ideas very quickly. NKU works themselves, the student work, I wonder if we must let art lead us to a landless place beyond language or before language, or as Emma Rose put it, beyond words. Thanks for it. Yeah. Is this a QR code? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? The QR code. Code. Yeah, QR yeah. So it's a pretty good reproduction, but it's so, you always have to see the original if you can. So this is a real easy way to make that point with students. We have so, um, posters from Frank Stella from around the world uh, that I picked up in my travels, and there's also an original artwork by Carola Bell, one of our and, NKU um, majors. So then um, we have uh, Clara Luz's whiteness book over there, which we'll look at in a minute, but while we're right here, I'll talk about these works. Uh, Robert Del who Beth talked about so well. Exactly the answer. So this was my ninth reading of the text, career. so I was familiar with the text, you know, to begin with. 
each week or so I would read several chapters ahead, 10 to 20 pages, just to sort of familiarize myself. And then, each day in the morning, I would read the page that I was to illustrate. And I, I wrote half the Stella book and ground to a halt at page 240. I just felt I was the wrong way. I had to start over and I'm glad it happened. Um, and uh, sometimes writer's blocks don't turn out well, but they can. That's a really dramatic example because I think this gestural screen is that it's the funniest book I have ever read. Um, and, and I laugh out loud uh, reading Moby Dick uh, every time. And um, there's so much of that uh, playfulness in and the arts. Um, can never be finished. And readers and teachers and students alike have responded. And we've seen over the past four days one remarkable pattern of response in today's symposium in the work Bob Wallace has done with his students over the past two decades. And once again, I congratulate him on two decades of Moby Dick art. Uh, <laughs> uh, Fred was in my class in 94, and he was an art major, and I was requiring, like literary people do, a research paper. And he says, you know, I'm an art major. Can I do a painting instead of a research paper in response to Moby Dick? And I said yes, and that's why we have 105 works by 53 students. He was the first of the 53, uh, and the other 52 have followed, and a lot of those are right here. And uh, first of all, let's just raise your hands, those who are the Moby Dick artists in the room. It's amazing what they've done, and um, if you can grab them, if you get a chance after we eat, ask them to take you to what they uh, did and explain it, uh, talk about it. It's really great to hear what they've done. And we also have amazing experts from around the country who have been here for the symposium.